so I'm Gilad Litvin, I'm an ophthalmologist. Um, I am uh, I will I studied medicine in uh, Israel in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and continue on to residency here in the Mayor Medical Center under the supervision of Ehud Asya and uh, a subspecialty in retinal surgery. Be and from there on, uh, I went to a, a career developing medical devices. My first patent I drafted in the final years of my uh, public uh, uh, service in, uh, in the health system here. Uh, but since then, I've devoted mo more of my time to developing medical devices and much less to uh, practicing medicine. Currently, I do uh, one day a week where I see patients and perform procedures. And the other part of the week I spent on uh, developing these uh, inventions of mine. Sure. So uh, I, I drafted this uh, patent uh, and uh, admitted it in 2015. Um, it is my idea. Um, it's the second patent I drafted. It uh, combines my understanding of uh, chemical engineering um, and biology. And uh, I think for the first time, a completely synthetic implant to replace the cornea uh, was developed until now in order to integrate between the artificial and the, our own human body, some form of uh, carrying tissue harvested either from other individuals or even from uh, other animals is used in order to integrate between the synthetic and biological. And for us, for the first time, we, I was able to develop an artificial cornea that uses only synthetic materials and integrates within our own uh, eye wall. So this un unmet need is... Uh, it depends on geography. Yeah. If you go to areas where um, the medicine is not very uh, good and uh, uh, cornea banks or, or again, implantation is scarce, and this is over 50% of humanity, you have no access to corneal tissue. Uh, so first of all, in order to give access to this uh, huge part of humanity who has no access, of course, if you have a completely synthetic implant that can stand on the shelf, can be transported and so forth, you can solve this issue. So this is one unmet need. And the second aspect, uh, if you even go to developed countries with very good medical uh, care, you'll see that about 20% of uh, corneally blind patients aren't suitable for corneal transplantation because of medical reasons. Uh, they either will reject this uh, uh, this uh, corneal transplantation for sure, or other medical reasons that don't uh, don't give uh, a high chance of uh, acceptance of this uh, transplanted donor tissue from a deceased individual. So 20% of the patients are unsuitable for corneal transplantation, and there are about over half of the world that has no access. So initially, this is the unmet need. These are our patients. We also I also believe that because the optics that we can shape and mold uh, is something predetermined. And that's uh, contrary to uh, harvested tissue, which when you take an optical tissue and try to suture it very precisely in place, there's always distortions. And the optical distortions, about a quarter or a third of the patients can take a year to wane down. So for the initial year, they don't see well. Anyways, here we have predetermined optics. The patient uh, that we did, the first initial patient, the minute we took off the bandages, immediately he saw to his potential, uh, which is also an additional, um, let's say it's not an unmet need, but a problem or an issue with corneal transplantation that we are trying to tackle. Um, so of course, in a clinical trial, uh, I'm not the investigator. Uh, we uh, approach an investigator here in Israel, a professor called Irit Bachar. She's a very experienced uh, corneal surgeon and the director of one of the departments here uh, for ophthalmology, uh, a well-known uh, worldwide researcher and surgeon. Um, she 
uh, found the first patient, which she thought was suitable. Uh, of course, according to a protocol that we drafted with inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. And you have to understand when you work with a site like this, it's always in collaboration. So if there are any things that we, we don't agree, we sit down and we think together how to, so we finalize the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And after eventually finding the appropriate uh, first patient, um, we uh, trained twice together uh, when I actually taught her uh, how to perform this and also observed her doing it twice, uh, twice or three times, making sure that she feels competent. And when she felt competent and uh, sure that she could go to the procedure, we scheduled uh, the surgery. Um, there was an assistant, not me, very also very experienced surgeon sitting by her side, but I was in the room. We received a special authorization from the Ministry of Health for me to be there and, and view and, and help. And I tried to give my uh, advice, you know, every few minutes, look within the microscope, tell her, listen, you're doing great. Listen here, put, you know, pay attention to this and this. But all in all, it took about an hour net, the whole procedure, which is not very long for a corneal surgery um, or other previous attempts were always longer for artificial uh, corneas, hours of surgery in order to implant. Here it was a very simple and straightforward procedure. And the day after, um, the patient said that he slept well, he had no pain, and he hasn't had any pain since. And if you look at one of his interviews, he says, listen, all the previous transplantations where I fell, immediately after the procedure, my eye was very, very painful, but here I saw and there was no pain. So an additional advantage that we found out from this guy, that it's not planned, but at least we understand the, um, you know, after, after the fact that he feels well. And his vision has stayed exactly the same stable for the past two uh, plus months uh, since the implantation. His eye is quiet. There's no inflammation or infection. And as I said, his visual acuity is stable. And he's uh, extremely happy seeing some of his grandchildren for the first time ever, uh, being able to uh, dial on his phone to his friends, you know, making his own coffee, small things. But uh, this is something very important for a 78 year old man who has been blind for the past decade. Um, I was present. It was uh, the culmination of five years of, of very hard work and a lot of anxiety and excitement. And, you know, a, a lot of things we had to push through, difficulties, uh, it's a very uh, uh, ambitious project. So seeing that moment when he started to read the digits off the board, it was, you know, it brought tears to, to our eyes. I think that the patients himself, it took him a, about a couple of hours to understand what has just happened. He was the, you know, the most uh, indifferent in, in this room, but I think it was because he was very shocked and later when I talked to him, he was much more excited. Uh, I can say that both me and my par partner, you know, shed a few tears uh, after working hard for this project uh, five years, but also uh, the department director, that uh, uh, surgeon that is the investigator in our trial was also very moved. Um, so so that's, that's to summarize. It's a very moving, but also, uh, Objectively, we could have, we could see the difference, and it was unbelievable. So we have received approval in Canada, and we're going to initiate the trial there, uh, both in Vancouver, the University of British Columbia, and the University of Toronto, and University Health Network, Toronto Western Hospital. Uh, these centers will be led by the local professors all of which are uh, uh, leaders in their field uh, worldwide. Um, next Sunday, we will do the, the upcoming implantation here in Israel, the second one. Uh, so uh, that one is planned for this Sunday, the 21st, I think. And uh, we have also an additional plan for the 11th of April. Um, and I believe that about then, the beginning of April, uh, implantations will start in uh, in Canada. 
Except for that, we have submitted uh, requests for the Ministry of Health in Netherlands, for the FDA, and for France. So all, all together, we ap applied for 50 patients. Uh, the FDA asks for at least 20. So I believe that when we reach 30 patients, we will stop this uh, trial and follow up for, it for a year and then submit to the FDA to get approvals. Once we get these approvals uh, for the initial set of uh, indications, people who have failed uh, previous corneal transplantation or are not suitable for one, we will go after uh, primary indications probably and uh, submit a larger trial to prove better efficacy and safety. So that's our plan for the upcoming, let's say, couple of years. Um, and could you tell me what uh, distinguishes this uh, this um, implant from similar um, other projects? Sure. So I told you before that we don't rely on any donor tissue. So uh, when we look at previous devices uh, that have received approval, we have actually two that uh, that have approval until now. One is called the Boston K Pro. Uh, out of the mass eye and ear uh, sector of uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, it's the ophthalmic division of the Harvard Medical School. And one of their previous directors, a uh, professor called Klaus Dolman, developed this. They use uh, cornea in order to integrate between our own human body. They take uh, uh, donated cornea tissue that's not suitable for transplantation because it's not transparent enough. And they use that to integrate between their artificial. And the other one is the osteodontocarotid, which uses a part of your tooth and your bone to integrate it with the eye. And uh, our device doesn't need any donor tissue. So in areas where you don't have any tissue banks, you can use our device. It can sit on the shelf and wait for the patient. Instead of asking the patient, listen, we have donor tissue, you have two days to come and you have to stop your life for the next month because you're gonna be a, an organ uh, transplantee. So instead of doing that and, and you know halting the, the life of someone in a moment that somebody else died, and now you have this tissue and you need to implant it now, otherwise the tissue is not viable. It has a week between a harvest and possible transplantation. So here we have a device that sits on, on the shelf so we can time the procedure and Maybe the key uh, point is a, is a, comes from an engineering, let's say, uh, perspective. And we integrate the device into the white part of our eye, whereas all previous attempts tried to integrate it to the cornea. And the cornea is a transparent tissue, so it doesn't have any blood vessels and has very, very few cells and it heals very, very poorly. Even if we get wounded there, it takes time. And Whereas the white part of our eye, every time we have a small inflammation, you immediately see it congested and red because the blood vessels there, they immediately attack whatever is, is coming at. Uh, so we use this virtual space. We were able to show that uh, using this, uh, we uh, create robust integration for the long term. Uh, so this is the from the mechanical, let's say engineering aspect, a different connecting site. Uh, so we have two projects in uh, glaucoma. One uh, is a clinical trial that just started in Toronto uh, Prism with Ike Ahmed, and um, and another center is at uh, uh, Toronto Western, David Ruffman, for the patch. Uh, it's a patch to conceive glaucoma shots and other irritating implants. And we have already implanted uh, five patients. And so far, it, look, it looks very well, good. Um, and the third project, which is entering uh, uh, animal cells now, is a glaucoma drainage device called the eShot. Again, using uh, advanced chemical engineering technology to try and imitate our own drainage pathways, but synthetically. Similar to the way we try, I, I use the, this chemical engineering to try to fool the body into believing a synthetic, completely synthetic cornea is actually biological and it will integrate. Try to use the same logic 
and create a glaucoma drainage device that imitates its own drainage apparatus in the eye, uh, giving a physiological pressure uh, following the implantation. And uh, so this is the third project. We have already writ writ written IP in other fields of medicine as well. And we have a project uh, going uh, into initial uh, steps in periodontology and uh, dentistry for gingival recession. And uh, future projects will probably also be, we have been approached by orthopedics, uh, general surgeons, gynecologists, and so forth, because um, our core competency is creating an artificial let's say extracellular matrix or an artificial micro tissue skeleton. And the minute we put that within our body, the cells are fooled and are grow and grow into it similar to let's say an ant farm. When you have a child and you buy an ant farm and he puts the ants inside and the ants don't know that it's not outside. They believe that it's their ant farm and they live and they make their house. The cells are fooled in a similar way to grow in, into our matrix and embed it within our own body.